Hey everyone, Thomas here today with Liesel and we have an exciting interview in front of us because I know that especially highly sensitive people often struggle with becoming self-employed, starting their own business and all the marketing methods that are non-authentic and that don't work because they just don't feel right. They're just head-based. And what she is doing is she loves helping sensitive introverts to go beyond what they thought was possible for them and supports them to let go of fears and concerns, build confidence and to love and embrace their strengths. She loves seeing them grow into confident, quiet people who make a difference in the world in their unique way. And this is so amazing because, yeah, it's such a great business that you have. It's such a gift that you give into the world by supporting these people. And I'm really interested in your story, like, because I know that there's a lot we can struggle with as introverts, as like quiet people. Um, so that maybe as the first question, like, um, when you started, what was the biggest challenge that you had? Or, or even what, what was the point where you were thinking of starting and like this, like very beginnings? Thank you so much, Thomas. It's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's sort of starting with my background, I was a musician for about 10 years and then a computer programmer for about 10 years. And in that programming business, I realized this is super stressful for me that it's, it's not a great environment for a sensitive person. Good environment for an introvert because I didn't have to talk to too many people. But the sensitive part of me was struggling in a corporate environment. In, and in that space, I realized actually what I really, really want to do is to help people. I want to just support other people to grow and to learn. And, and in order to do that, I first needed to grow and learn myself. Um, so I started going on some courses. I, I had a very supportive husband. We just gotten married and I, I shared this big struggle about, I can't stay in this environment anymore, but I don't know what I'll do for a living. I just don't know. And he was incredibly supportive and he said, we'll sort out the money somehow, but stop doing this work and start doing what you really want to do. So I started going on some courses that would enable me to support other people like it was first um, hands-on healing and then later on some more emotional support like uh, the tool of EFT and so on and I, I started a very very part-time business with my new skills just doing you know one client a week at home and of course I think perhaps many of us are deluded in a way that we think if I bring my passion and my, my new skills and, you know, whatever I love to the world, then people will just come flooding in. Many of our listeners might be able to identify with that disillusionment. <laughs> it's not often the way it works. So I figured out, oof, okay, this is not going to be a full-time business very soon. I'm going to have to supplement my income. And what I did is just, just go back to some of my programming work part-time to make sure that I had a bit of a stable income and not panic about income every month. And <clears throat> I did sort of almost very brave, bold. And now what I look back on and think is it was a little bit foolish to do that. I hired a very expensive room at in a center where I thought because many people were going to walk past there and see it, they would be intrigued and, you know, come in for some healing or massage, what I was doing at the time as well. Didn't happen that way either. So I had this massive expense every month to cover. Mm. And, uh, you know, it was just such a learning curve, Thomas. So the, the, the first inklings for me was in that corporate job, like I have to do something different and it's going to have to do with, helping others to heal and to um, look inside and see what is there that have, has been covered and, and what needs gentle, compassionate care. And so that the very first two, three years was very, very up and down for me, a, a struggle because I realized nobody knows what I do. This is so different from what I used to do. 
the people who I used to talk to in my corporate environment has got no inkling. They, they think I'm, this is all woo woo. Mm. <laughs> and it was, it was a struggle for me to realize, actually, I'm a business owner now, and I need to not only have the skills of helping people with my coaching, my healing, but also the skills of owning a business. And those parts I did not have. So that was a, a struggle, to yeah. say the least. Yes. And what did help you overcome those struggles? Um, it's also a long and windy path. It's not an overnight success in the very, uh, you know, not at all. I wrote a book um, after I'd had my healing business for a couple of years and started having a bit more clients and start, things started flowing a bit. I wrote a book and I published it in 2013. The book is about being able to say no, <laughs> something I'd been struggling with for a very long time. and. When I wrote that book, I also realized I've got no idea how to market this book. The same story, um, how to put yourself out there, how to put the book out there. Nobody just walks into a bookstore and buys all my books. They don't even know the book is there or it exists. So I started on a journey with a book marketing mentor and she taught me so, so many things. So from there, it's just been one continuous learning journey. Um, I think it feels like we never stop learning. There's always new layers of learning, but I, I really needed to learn online marketing because at the time I was just, you know, talking to people in person. So my business started moving a bit more online and many people helped me overcome the, the fear of technology, you know, doing things like interviews, doing podcasts. Um, I hosted a tele summit. Oh my goodness. That was, it was, 2014 I think I was so petrified I can't tell you the nerves of you know being then it was just audio there was no video much available then so it was I think the thing for me is it was little bit by little bit as an introvert and sensitive people a sensitive person I think I, I just want to reiterate that that we don't find it comfortable to grow in huge leaps I think small consistent steps doing one thing it's like okay i can do that now Whew, relax a little bit okay what's next okay this one little step that's what i can tackle next so you know i can't say to you it was like you know i had to learn this and then that and then that and then that but there were so many things like starting my blog and starting to write newsletters and keep you know communicating overcoming the inner objections about but do people really want to hear from me? If I write this email, who on earth is going to want to read it? There were so many inside blogs that I had to look at for myself. And then the actions can follow after that. Hmm. That's a huge thing, which I also find like so important that the inner work comes first. And then when you have transformed, for sure, it will show in reality but then it's just following the flow. Um, yes. And I wonder, like, have you also faced this problem of needing marketing and then going out into the world and looking what's available and finding all the tools and stuff that didn't work for you or that didn't work for you as a highly sensitive person? Or did you just get right to the, to the right uh, marketing tools? <laughs> very good question <laughs> i did not the short answer is that i did not get right to the right marketing tools <laughs> because all the marketing programs out there are generally geared i think more for extrovert people who do talking about their work easily anyway so the marketing techniques that are taught in programs i did many many programs um, um i did a program with a uh, you know, Bill Barron, I don't know if you know the coach, Bill Barron, big coach in the US, very extroverted. His methods are wonderful and I wish I could follow them, but I was not able to because it just feels so counter to what my nervous system feels comfortable with. Um, there were many, I, I won't even name all the names, but I did many marketing programs every time thinking, no, if I did this one, maybe I'll get it right. Mm -hmm. 
And truly, there were some elements of it that I could use that felt authentic. And most of it was just like, I cannot do it that way. And then I end up feeling like a failure. Because here's this thing that works very well for that person. And they seem to get success with it. And some of the people or many of the people in their programs also have success with it. And they shout about their success. What's wrong with me? Why does it not work for me? So... I'm, I'm still on that journey, Thomas, you know, discovering things as I go along. Oh, okay. If I do it this way, it feels good to me, but it's counter to most of the advice out there. Yeah. So that's a little bit of a, uh, like a mind shift. Like, am I really allowed to do it my way? <laughs> you know, will I, will I, will, will there be success that way? Um, one of the things I did recently was, to, um, I always used to, we called it an ethical bribe, right? You have on your website, uh, uh, if you sign up for my newsletter, then here's a gift. Mm. Yeah, I had that for so many years and I felt good about it. And just recently I thought, you know what? If people really want to hear from me every month, I want to communicate. I want to send an email newsletter to people who really want to hear from me, not because I gave them this thing that they temporarily was were interested in so I took that off my website and now I feel so much more in alignment mm. the people who sign up for my newsletter want to hear from me just because of what I have to say yes they're not going to unsubscribe in another month because actually what I say now is not what they wanted to hear about in that one single little piece of my work that was the gift yeah. so and things like that yeah and this is so interesting because I know that a lot of people are thinking about conversion rates and how big is my list and that kind of stuff. And they forget about the quality. Because if you have a thousand people who just wanted your free stuff, sign up for that and moved all your following emails in the spam folder, it will not do you any good. But if you have 50 people who say, please let me know when you do the next workshop, um, I want to stay in touch with you. That would be 50 customers. So yes. by realizing this, this is also some point for me that like, because it's like layers, right? It's like mm -hmm. layers you get rid of that don't feel authentic. And for some time you can hold them on. Yes. But then there's the day where you feel like, no, <laughs> this needs to go. Yes. Uh, Yes, exactly like that. I walked with that uncertainty inside of myself for maybe a year or two years. Like, yeah, I don't know about that. You know, I have so many people on my email list who signed up because, say, they, they attended my tele summit hmm. and it was about self care. But now that's not only the thing I talk about. So they on that list for a little while and then, <clears throat> like, they unsubscribe. <laughs> And then, you know, we feel like, oh, do they not want to hear from me anymore? So it just, it was a long process in my mind. Like, is it okay to do that? And I know that every, just about every marketing person I go to in the world will say to me, you're making such a mistake. You're leaving people on the table. You know, they won't be able to hear from you again ever. <sighs> you know, I'm, I just am tired of trying to be what I'm not. Um, trying to hook people and um, yeah, that conversation we had one time about, you know, the target and the, all of that. Oh no, that just doesn't feel good to me. So if they really want to hear from me, they'll sign up anyway, just because they're interested in something that I said on the website or, and that now I know who I'm talking to. It's the people who really, really are interested in, yes. uh, yeah. I'm using some of my blogs and my offers and that just feels so easy in my nervous system. And when I'm feeling easy about it, that will radiate out in the world. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So uh, right now, how is your business set up? Like what are the offers that you have? I work mostly at the moment with private clients, uh, Thomas. So I have programs for people, uh, you know, three months minimum. 
because that's more or less the amount of time I feel that we can start building momentum and create permanent change. Change does not happen overnight and people want you know, like if only I could do this, you know, quickly, it's not usually the way it works in our nervous system. So we work in a slow, gentle, gradual way that just helps the change to settle in in a very kind, compassionate way. So I work um, with people privately. We see each other twice a month or so. Some people need a little bit more in the beginning and then scale down to twice a month. And then um, from time to time, maybe every two months or so, I have a group and uh, usually it would involve something like um, letting go of some emotional stuff around, um, say, being visible or um, it always has a theme or like maybe recently I held one about money, all the uncomfortable stuff we hold in our body mind and brain about money that's bad and all of that because we can't attract money if we feel like it's not our friend so my groups are usually smallish um five people or so per group so it feels introvert and sensitive people friendly and then from time to time i have offers with colleagues as well and one of them for instance was um how to have a difficult conversation with courage so we teach very practical skills and then also very, uh, we work with the emotions around what's uncomfortable about difficult conversations, a conflict and so on. So it's, you know, I, it, I don't have sort of permanent groups on the go at the moment, but there's always room for people to request what they're interested in. And then I create something from that. This is so amazing and like because there are so many also online marketers who teach like this is how you scale up fast and build your online or info product empire and this temptation of passive income like put it once there, bombard the people with ads and then you're free and you can live on the beach somewhere in a nice <laughs> place with great weather, not UK weather but really nice weather. Um, so it seems like you, you're just really doing what you love. Um, but have you also been tempted by this like dream um, that, I, that is sold out there? Mm, that's such a fabulous question. I'm so happy you asked that. I think there is always a temptation for human beings to want something that feels easier than the current struggle that we're busy with. And I think I have been tempted in the past. You know, I've, I was involved in, I, I don't know if you know, network marketing, uh, like say Amway. And so, so I've been tempted a few times by that because that promise and the, you know, what you'll get at the end just sounds so good. So <laughs> it was in those experiences, Thomas, that I think I realized that kind of thing just doesn't work in my nervous system. Mm. Having to, it, it's exactly, it's having to approach people with, a, with an agenda. Yeah. That doesn't feel true and authentic. Like I have to almost get them to a meeting without telling them what it's really about. And all of that, just like, oh, I, I felt drained. I hated it. I absolutely can't do it. Mm -hmm. So that's where I learned that kind of thing. Having this promise of you do a huge amount of work now and then you can live the life that you want. It's not going to work for me. I want to live my life right now in a way that yes. I love and enjoy. It's like, why must I put myself through all sorts of awful things and hate every minute and have dread in my stomach when I get up? I, I want to do something that feels good in my body, that is health creating, that feels like wellness, that I can be a model for as well for my clients. So... I let go of the illusions. I think that I will ever be having this empire that no longer draws me. I must say, I, I don't do well in huge groups anyway. I love being able to connect with people one-on-one. -on -one. And if there's a group of 500 people in front of me, I just don't feel that same connection. Yeah. So that's why my groups are like five people at a time. Maybe they will grow to 10 in time, but this is what works for me. When I think about my group, I think, oh, I love it. I'll be able to have a deep, warm connection with every person in that group. Mm -hmm. And I feel fabulous afterwards about the value that I provided. 
um, the relationships that I built, just the relationships and the connection is so important for me in my business. And that is what makes all the difference for me. If I, if I um, keep that in mind, it's like, that's what I want in my life. At the end of my life, when I look back, I think I want to look back at the relationships and how each piece person felt when they were in my presence and afterwards and how I felt not how many millions of people I reached and having that beach or what will you do after a week on that, you know, beach? Yes, exactly. How will you feel fulfilled <laughs> and like you're adding value and making a difference in the world then? We need people for that anyway. Yeah. So. I think it's so amazing because like how people get hooked on this like passive income dream and like uh, work once hard and then you are free forever. Yes. They they don't think it to the end because if you think like, okay, then I have the money. Yeah. Then I don't need to work. The day still has 24 hours. <laughs> so what will I do? Yes. And that's the big question. So I also came to the conclusion that if, yeah, if I have to do something anyhow, then I can just do what I love to do. And then it doesn't feel like work. And this is also something I was unwinding in my brain um, that there are things that I do and that I love to do. And then there's work and work means I do this to receive money. And I just released this whole thing. And it's really interesting because now it feels like I'm just doing what I love doing. Yes. And sometimes um, while I'm doing what I'm loving, some money is flowing back to me. But I don't even really care. It's just like, I'm doing my stuff. Oh, money coming. I'm going on doing my stuff. No money coming. Then again, I, <laughs> I do I my stuff. That. Again, money is coming. So there's, yes. I, I don't even look at it. It just, for example, uh, yesterday I had, I had a coaching out in nature. So I was just taking my coachee to walk in nature. Oh, um, and it was just like, not it was just like, it was a conversation with a great friend that I could support on her journey. Mm. And this time money was floating it, towards It happened me. to flow, yes. Yes, but other times it was just a friend. The context was different. The conversation was similar, but it was a friend friend. <laughs> yes. So no money was floating in. Yes. But the pleasure that I got from it was the same. Exactly. It doesn't feel more pleasurable when you know the money is going to come. It, it, it's if we do what we love. And I think that's what was part of my journey is to determine for myself, what is it really that I love? Where are my strengths? Yeah. Trying to, you know, forgetting about the things that I think I should be doing or that other people are saying I should do for money and find a life, create a life where I use my strengths, where it feels like no work at all. I'm just doing what I love anyway. Yes. If we can create a life that way, then, you know, what, what, what more do you want? Um, why would we want a life just on a beach yes. if we're already doing what makes us so happy? Yeah. And, and I can tell you, I mean, I had this dream of passive income, so I went for it. Uh, and and when it worked out um, after the first big launch, um, I went to India for four months. So then I was sitting there on the rice field with my MacBook um, and was working there. Um, wow. And it was nice for a while. It was pretty hot there. And I was sitting on the rice field because another place, like wherever I went, people were just approaching me. So there was no space for me. On the rice field even sometimes people came so i don't know how they saw me but i was really wow. hiding but then yeah there was no point for me after a while because i realized either i'm sitting on the meadow in india or in germany and i already did what i love doing so it was just like okay the grass is different the yeah. temperature is different yes. um it's harder to get food that i love or i always need to like have a debate with a um, with a salesman about the price in Germany. I can just give them money and <laughs> <laughs> simple transaction. Yes, 
but it's just the little details that change like the yeah. overall thing was like the context was like pretty strong and what i love doing and this is what i see that so many people are because they don't know what they want or who they are or what their strengths are Mm. So they care about all the details that are completely unimportant and yes. build their life around the small details. Yes, I love that. That's a very, uh, it's fabulous that you experience that for yourself in your own life. And it's like, okay, so I tried that. I know mm -hmm. it didn't give me what I thought mm -hmm. it was going to give me because I do find, Thomas, don't you think as well as our values change over the course of our life? So if we're 18 and we're just out of school and we realize like, oh, there's this big world out there and I, you know, our values are very different. Then those outer trappings may be the thing that we think we really need for happiness. And then at 30 or at 40 or at 50, we realize those things, it's nice. But, you know, I can just... I can be just as happy sitting in a park here just outside my front door looking at the birds for just 10 minutes being fully present and then I can come back and do some more things of what I love. It, it, I don't have to have the big expensive car or the, you know, living in the hotel on the beach um, posting pictures on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. So maybe as a last question to to sum it up because i think we have covered a lot in here a lot of valuable stuff um what are the biggest three mistakes you made or that you would like would if you would have known you wouldn't have done it <laughs> and what's mm. the three things that really worked out well for you that you intuitively or somehow did are we talking now about this whole journey in in my in yes. this in this yes. career in my um, own business? Yes. <clears throat> Let me see. I may not be able to come up with three, but I'll see what I can do. Yeah. First well, one, one is, is <laughs> good. Yeah. So the first one was expecting that just because I love this new thing that I'm doing and I'm passionate about it, that business will just flow in. Um, I think there needs to be a little bit of realism in there and some skills and tools and methods and some knowledge because it's a whole different thing to just do what you love and making a business of it, you know, making that money flow in because we can't not have, we can't have no money coming in, then hunger strikes. <laughs> um, so expecting it to just work without going on a journey of inner knowledge. Um, another one was, you know, renting a room and having that huge expense before my income proved mm -hmm. that I could cover that expense. So that led to huge anxiety and panic. Um, can't think of another one right now. Um, I think another mistake was not knowing myself well enough or not being okay with the fact that my nervous system as an introvert and a sensitive person is different than the extroverts who teach us certain th ways of marketing. I did not understand that in the beginning of my marketing journey. And so what I would do differently um, is to recommend to people is get to know yourself, get to know your personality, get to know your strengths, get to know what works for you and, and learn to love that and embrace that. So that we don't go comparing ourselves to how other people are doing it. Um, one of the big things for me is we keep comparing our insides to other people's outsides. Mm. And it looks so easy for them. But what's going on here is a very big struggle and internal conflict. So um, perhaps I can just um, end with that as what I would do differently is get to know myself and embrace and love myself just as I am and go with what's going to be authentic for my inside. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time and yeah, for sharing your beautiful story. Thank you so much, Thomas. It was a great joy and thank you for your great questions. <laughs> so how can people reach out to you? How do they find you? I'll also put the link down in the description. 
Thank you so much. I think the easiest is my website, SavvySelfGrowth.com. Great. Thank you. And yes, I wish you a lot of fun digesting the information that you received and maybe the emotions uh, that come up if they are coming. <laughs> and see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you, Thomas.